You know, one thing I've gotten better at at my vlogs, on my vlogs, is making sure, you know, for a lot of the time when I try to get my point across, I want to do it so that you can focus on like what I'm talking about. So I didn't include background music for, for a lot of my clips, like in the beginning, but I've almost put music on every clip now. And when you do that, you obviously have to find no copyright music, right? Because if you use music that artists or whatever put out and you're not allowed to use it, YouTube's either gonna put a copyright strike on your video or they're just gonna take your video down altogether. So I'm just creeping around downloading new music and this dude, Joe Kim Karoot, he's like one of the, probably the most popular no copyright music guy on YouTube because Casey Neistat uses like all of his music in his vlogs. So I've been using a lot of his stuff. So right now I'm just looking all throughout YouTube and getting new beats and it's like, this song is so good. And that's an interesting way that he, when you're trying to make it big, I guess, like imagine being a producer in music. I can't imagine how hard it is to, to like make something of yourself. And he took like an alternate route. When I see someone blow up or someone's really big in a specific niche, I'm like, I wonder how they got there. And it's always because they thought outside of the box. You can do your typical, you know, I'm selling my beats and like spam everyone you know, or you can go and create your own niche and give free music away, thus building your personal brand, right? It's all value, it's all value, it's all value. The more value you give up front, the more it's gonna pay you back in the long run. And that's basically what he did. So I'm always thinking about things like that when I, when I see successful people that made it in like a weird or alternate industry or niche. All right, the weather seemed to have calmed down. So we're gonna take this bad boy for a spin. My first time, I'm definitely nervous. so stupid, I have no idea how to work this thing. All right, so we got this thing running. And you can see it comes up on the phone like exactly what you're getting the footage of. You probably can't even see this thing up there. I can barely see it through here, but it's all the way up there. I'm about to take it down by my high school, which is like a few blocks that way and see if I can get some good footage up on here. I don't know how this works or when it tells me the battery's gonna die or I don't know. I think I broke this thing. It's returning to home somewhere and that's his low battery, but I got it coming back. So hopefully it makes it before it dies. I hear it, it's so loud. Where are you? Oh, it's straight above us. Can you see that? I think all the birds were fucking with it. Oh wow, that was so close. Look how sick this thing is. Let's go. Bang. Boom. That was pretty sweet. Guess what I did? I didn't record any of that. So there's a record button on the thing, I thought it automatically recorded everything once you have the SD card in. Not the case, not the case. So everything I just did, it was horrible footage anyways probably, so it's not missing out on anything. But I'll, I'll do some more tomorrow, hopefully it's nice out. Sorry. So it's Saturday morning, we're getting some work done right now. This kind of sucks. So what I'm doing is basically, I, I've talked about the last few vlogs, how I'm looking to bring on people to help me with the fantasy stuff this summer. So bloggers, Excel, Photoshop, SEO, things like that. And at this point I've gotten probably like 40 to 50 emails, maybe even more than that, of people that are interested in helping me out. If they wanted to do some blogging or whatnot, I would answer and follow up and I'd just talk to them and see where they're at and then give them like a sample piece. Like I'd give them a topic and say, hey, you know what, write me an article about this and I'll see, you know, we'll see, we'll go from there. Like I said, there's been a lot of people that reach out to me, which is awesome. Again, I want to thank you. If you were one of those people and you're watching this and you put the time and effort into that from the bottom of my black heart, Genuinely, thank you. Unfortunately, I can't take on everyone that reached out to me. Um, it's just not how it's gonna work. I, among the Excel people, it's probably only gonna be one to two people, depending on how good you are, of course. Same thing with blogging. I've had a lot of people that are interested in blogging. Some of them have experience, some of them write for fantasy pros, some of them are journalism majors in college, some of them have real world experience like writing for actual media publications, which is crazy to me that they wanna help me out. But nonetheless, uh, there are a lot of people that reach out that are maybe like high school kids and their writing is not really, you know, great. They're, they're passionate, you know, I could tell by how they reach out to me and 
say that's inspiring and they want to be part of this brand and they really, you know, they're excited about it, I could tell. And it like, it, it breaks my heart that I have to be like, I'm sorry, you know, because I was in their position, you know what I mean? Like I started with nothing. I had never blogged before. I still consider myself horrible at blogging. I'm a terrible writer. And had like one, had Fantasy Jocks, the company I work with, not giving me a chance to Kind of write their blog section. I have no idea where I could be, where I would be. So one, I thank them for that. But you know, these are the little things in life that can lead you down weird paths. Like certain opportunities open doors that you would never imagine down the road. So it's really hard for me to like this. Is the first email I'm writing right now is to tell one of these kids that I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to kind of I don't want to say hire because I'm not. It's not for pay right now, but bring you onto the team, I guess. And I feel like it's gonna not only kill me, but it's going to really kill these kids because they're young, you know? And like, I still remember like applying for blogging positions with like Bleacher Report or Fantasy Pros or some of those guys. And they'd be like, oh, sorry, like we're, you're not what we're looking for. And I'm like, like now you wish I was writing for you probably because I have a bigger following than 95% of your writers. But you know, everyone starts at nothing. So for a lot of people, all you need is the chance. I don't know really what I'm getting at other than this is re it's really hard to tell people that they're not gonna be working with me. If you're someone who is in a management position and you've had to fire people, I'm sure this is what it feels like, but 50 times worse because that's a real life situation. It's weird because I, I know how passionate these kids are about a lot of the things I do. And like for me to be like, no, you're not good enough. So I'm trying to word it like as nicely as I possibly can and be like, listen, there's a lot of people who are overqualified that reached out to me. It does not mean that you're not good enough. It doesn't mean that in the future we can't work together or anything like that. I don't know. I just feel weird about it. Hmm. I'm finna cry. Look at the bottom of the email. Please. Your friend, Nick. Let them know that we're still boys, that we're still friends. Oh, man, I just became the worst person ever. Zam. All right, so this next clip is just gonna be, I'm going to the gym and I'm going to film basically uh, most of my chest, tricep, shoulder workout, like a push workout. And I'm gonna do a voiceover and kind of explain everything as I go along. And hopefully you guys can get some value out of it. Um, this is, again, just a push push day. And I think the biggest thing to take away from here is when you go to the gym, right? Like if you're lifting, if you're doing like body weight or something, know what you're trying to improve. Like for instance, like this workout was very upper chest related. Like this is a muscle that I'm really trying to work on, like my incline chest muscles and as well as like my delts and stuff. So know that going in and that's why most of the exercises I do are focused on those muscles. So the first exercise we're doing is the incline bench press. Like I said, I want to focus on the upper chest. And, you know, when you go into a workout knowing exactly what you want to be working, you could figure out exactly what exercises you need to be doing. And if it's a specific muscle, then you want to take kind of the hardest exercise you could do. Put that at the beginning of the workout so that um, you could do the heaviest weight at that point. You could do the most reps, the most volume and give that. Uh, that muscle tissue, the biggest breakdown that it can get. If you do it at the end of the workout, then obviously it's going to be a lot harder to put up more weight and use more volume. So you're not targeting that muscle as hard. So basically when you set up on the incline, I'm, again, and I always preach this, it's always about form over weight. Like obviously I could throw on a 45 and a 35, do four shitty reps, but incline, you see me coming down and not to brag, but I have pretty perfect form on this. You want to set up so the bench is like 45 degrees tops. You don't want to go any higher than that. You don't want to go like sitting at 60 degrees because then you're going to be working your shoulders a lot. You want to go 45 if not lower. And you can see my back com coming off the chair. And that's to give myself even less of a of an angle that I'm working with um, so that you can hit that upper chest. And you want to have the bar directly over basically your chin. Bring it down to the top of your chest. And one of the, the most important thing here is having your shoulders pinched back. You want to make sure that your shoulders, your front your front delts aren't doing the work. So by pinching your shoulder blades back, that puts more stress and more tension on the actual chest and the upper muscle. And it's so important to really focus on the, uh, the upper chest when you're doing the movement. It's really easy to go through the motions. But you can see, right, my shoulders are pinched back. They're not forward. They're not the ones pushing the weight up. It's all in the upper chest. And you can see the upper chest is almost at the point where it's hitting my chin. So you want to come down and then explode right back up boom you see me coming down slowly hitting the mark coming back up quickly so i'll usually do maybe like three or four warm-up sets with a 25 on each side a 35 a 45 then maybe throw a 10 on with the 45 and then from there once i find a good weight that i could do six to eight really good reps with that's when i'll um that's when i'll stop and i'll do like three to four good sets making sure i could hit hit the weights there um, and by that time, you know, your your upper chest is kind of on fire. Next. So this is also uh, such a good 
movement here. I, I know a lot of people reach out to see, um, you know, how can you get your chest or your, uh, your pecs more defined or more ripped. And I can honestly say number one is using isolated movements, using machines and cable rows that you could do one arm at a time. This has probably become my favorite, favorite movement where you take a cable row about chest height and you bring it across your chest. Because if you're doing movements that aren't isolated, like you do the regular fly, the pec machine, where your two arms come together and they hit, you don't get that crossover where like if you're sitting there right now watching, take your arm as if you're doing a fly. And instead of going just lining up with the middle of your chest, once you hit the end of the movement, go a little past it. Like you see how my arm goes past my chest and then feel your pec muscle. Like it gets such a, a much heavier of a of a tightening there. And if you do it ISO, you're going to be able to hit those muscles so much more. So I incorporate that move as uh, you'll see it even more so in further into the videos. Um, but again, I'm doing some shoulders. This is another part of my exercises that I want to hit. Like I want to hit my delts and my upper chest are big focuses for me. So I'll superset. Um, I love doing supersets because one, I mean, they obviously save you a lot of time. But two, if you're doing like, for instance, I was doing the chest movement where it's only hitting like one pec at a time. And then this is just doing my side and, and front delts. Those two aren't getting fatigued at the same time during both exercises. So that is a good way to superset. Like I wouldn't suggest doing like bench press with flies or like two back movements back to back with supersets because you're just fatiguing the muscle by itself. You're not able to really put up the most weight and the most volume on the two different muscle sets. So for here again, for any kind of side raise, delt raise, you always want to have your shoulder blades pinched back. You know, it gives you that more aesthetic look and you're and you're focusing on the right muscles. If you're just going up and down, up and down or front and side, um, you're going to be putting too much stress on the wrong parts of your shoulders, like the tendons and stuff. And again, here, here it goes back to the upper chest. Like, look at me squeezing. You come through and you squeeze and you're able to feel that muscle like really, really contract. And I think the upper chest is a problem for a lot of people because it's really hard to feel that muscle kind of push and grow when you're doing movements that aren't isolated and aren't specifically focused on it. So, you know, you'll see me do the cable flies on an actual machine and you can do it with chest press too. So machines that you would do like you know, they replicate the bench press, but you're actually sitting down on a machine or something sit instead of sitting straight forward, you sit at like a 45 degree angle and you only use one arm and bring that arm across your chest. Um, so again, yeah, I'll do probably like three or four sets of the isolated cable flies over here and then I'll superset it all with side lat raises, front lat raises, um, until I feel really fatigued and I want to move on to the next exercise, which I don't know what it is. I'm kind of just freestyling all this off the top of my head, by the way. If you have any questions, I know I'm going fast, just drop a comment or shoot me an email and I'll be able to explain it a little bit better. So again, I move on to the flies where it's it's just the same thing, but it's an alternate movement. So I sit not straight away, but like at a 45 degree angle. So your chest, so your arm can come all the way across your chest. I'm telling you, if you feel your chest muscle while you're doing this exercise, you're going to feel such a, a better like focus and such a better uh, pump on, on that muscle. And again, you could do this with a chest press. So the same exact thing. Instead of doing flies, you're sitting down on a machine like this and you're using one arm to push the muscle up. Same thing, I just switch arms. I do it like eight reps or 10 reps on one side, then switch it and I'll probably do four sets overall. Um, by this time, your, your titty feels like it's about to pop off. And then at the end of the workout, you know, we've done shoulders, we've done a lot of incline, chest. Uh, I've, I've been working on, on getting some more arms incorporated into my workouts. It's not something I really ever did, but a lot of times if you feel like shoulder pain or chest pain, it's probably because you have a weakness or an imbalance, right? Like maybe your triceps are weak. So that means your shoulder has to um, balance that, right? And you're putting more stress on your shoulder or your chest. So although I don't really like the thought of having like big arms or anything like that, I feel like it's it's probably better if you work on those muscles just because you don't want to cause imbalances. So these are two of my favorite tricep exercises. Just a uh, straight pull down um, with the rope. I always use a rope for any of these kind of things because I feel a better pull in the muscle. So I'll do like eight reps of pulling down and then I'll immediately flip over. And I love the next exercise that I do because it gives you such a, a strong stretch in the triceps. It's not about really power or explosion. You see me walk out, make sure that your core is really tight. And boom, you want to bring it. You see the rope go all the way back and you see the stretch in my triceps. That's what you're aiming for. Not so much to push forward. Obviously, you want to have uh, a weight that's low enough for you to be able to push it forward and stay like tight throughout your core. 
but all the way back, right? You see all the way back and then go. You wanna get that really nice stretch in your tricep. So I'll do um, probably three sets, three supersets of that. And this is how I've been ending like a lot of my workouts, whether it's pull, push, even legs. This is something that I got from uh, the YouTube channel, Athlean X, and I'll, I'll link them down below. Face pulls, face pulls, face pulls, face pulls. This is something I cannot recommend enough. This is more for aesthetics. This is to work your rear delts, right? When you're doing push movements, a lot of the times people are hunched over because they do so much bench press and they don't do things that focus on uh, rounding their shoulders back correctly. So I'll put a pulley rope probably about face height, maybe a little higher, and you want to pull it back. And you see like my upper my upper back is like pretty, pretty well defined up there and the real de rear delts are pretty good. And this is a movement that will help you look a lot more aesthetic. You want to take the ends of the ropes. Sorry, I'm just going to go in because I think this cut off. But you want to take the ends of the ropes and the way you want to do it is finish so that it looks like you're flexing your biceps. Like imagine you're just like putting up your two arms on your side and flexing your biceps and like showing your friends what your biceps looks like. That's how you want to end the exercise. So you're pulling it all the way to your face to the point where it's like you're in a curl movement at the end. And that will round up this workout. I didn't show every single set, but you get the point. If you have any questions about it, uh, please feel free to drop a comment below. Basically focus on the muscles that you want to hit the most and have those be the main primary focus of your workout. If you're looking to kind of rip or tighten up your chest or you're having trouble, you know, breaking a plateau there, I highly suggest doing isolated movements with it, whether it's flies, um, cable flies, chest press, anything like that is good. And I always end my workouts with face pulls for a more aesthetic to, it automatically pulls your shoulder back. So there's the Mazda, he did, it's totaled. Finally got done with insurance. Not done, but they gave me a value. They, it, I think it was like 60, 6,300 I'm getting for the car. I have a little bit of money to work with. Right now, I'm just gonna drive my sister's car probably like into the ground, because why not? I don't have to, you know, it's already paid for and everything. I am looking at, I wanna get a Jeep, a Jeep Wrangler, really bad. And like an older one though, like early 90s to 2000, one that has like a lot of miles on it, so I don't have to spend like 15, 20 grand on the car. But I don't know much about cars. I don't know much about Jeeps. From what I've been looking online and, and reading forums and stuff like that, if you keep them maintained well, they can run until like 300,000 miles. So. That'd be cool because you could buy them at a, obviously a discounted price if they're in like the 120,000 miles or something like that and still keep it going for a long time. But I don't know much about Jeep, so I'm gonna need to find someone that can help me if I go, you know, I'm, I'm looking on like Facebook Marketplace and looking at people that are selling their Jeep Wranglers. I wanna be able to take the top off. I don't know. That's just like, that car is just so me. I feel like I would love doing that in the summer. Just driving around with no top. I'd probably have the top off from like now until like October. I don't know, I would drive around like that in like 50 degree weather. If anyone knows things about Jeeps, like I've been I've been doing a lot of research, but I'm sure there's some like, the way there's like sneaker heads, there are definitely Jeep heads out there. So if any of you guys, any of you guys follow my videos and know things that I should be looking for, things that I need to be looking for when looking at used Jeeps, please drop a comment down below or DM me or email me or something like that, because that would be very helpful. It's really 4 a.m. right now. I've been doing weird shit like this sometimes. I couldn't sleep. I woke up starving and it's four. It's like, I'm not getting back to sleep. Might as well get up, make some eggs. Look at that, it looked pretty damn good. Throw some salsa on it. That stuff's good. I love these things. So that's my 3 a.m. breakfast or midnight snack if you want to call it. Throw some of this goat milk in there. That's not actually goat milk. I guess I gotta clarify that. I call everything the goat. It's actually almond milk, unsweetened vanilla, the best kind of almond milk. Time to get the day started, I guess. I don't want to wake my mom, that's why I'm whispering. Even though she's crazier than me, she's probably been up already. What do I got going on for today? Yesterday was filming day. Yesterday was Wednesday, today's Thursday. Working on one of my client's sales funnels, so all marketing stuff today. I need to get some footage of the drone. Hopefully it's nice out and a bunch of other stuff, so I'll, I'll keep you all posted. So here's the problem about waking up at four in the morning. It's 9 a.m. and I just got done making tacos. Like I've been up for five hours and now now I'm doing bad things. You shouldn't be doing it at nine in the morning, like eating tacos and drinking Diet Coke. But now my clock's all messed up. I also noticed that, and this is definitely facts, like a lot of times people talk about how sleep is a huge factor in, you know, anytime you read a list of like ways to lose weight or how to be healthier, and they always talk about sleep, right? They always talk about you need sleep to lose weight, you need sleep to recover, you need sleep, blah, blah, blah. 
Now, I'm one of those people, I don't think, well, I mean, sleep physically obviously helps you recover, but in terms of losing weight and diet, I don't think it has at all any physical effect on you. What it does is it has a big mental effect on you. When you don't sleep enough and you're tired, you lose this kind of sense of uh, kind of like right and wrong in terms of like how much you care about things, especially like if you're talking about like a diet. If you slept like two hours, you're going to be like groggy all day and you're not really going to care. You're just going to like want something like tacos at nine in the morning and not really give a fuck about what it does to you, right? You're just in a bad mood and you just don't care. So I don't think it physically, like you're not going to lose weight or gain weight depending on how much sleep you get, but I think it definitely dictates how your day is going to go. If you don't sleep a lot, you're going to be really tired by like six or seven. There's a good chance you're going to skip the gym. There's a good chance that you're going to eat like shit that day. On days that you sleep really well, you know, you're focused, you're energized. You don't need these other little shitty food to make you satisfied throughout the day. But for now, we're just going to eat tacos at nine in the morning. It's so good. And to be honest, it's not even that bad for you. Let me show you. Yeah, I'm gonna have to stick my fingers in the garbage. Look away if you're disgusted by me. This is 93.7 lean ground beef. 170 calories for four ounces. That's probably eight ounces altogether in there. I cooked it all up and I have the rest sitting in there. We'll say that's like 350 calories for the beef. The tortillas are just like regular general flour tortillas. Two of them is 170, so we're looking at uh, 340 plus 170, 500. And then the rest is just like, that's a really small amount of guacamole, probably 50 calories worth of guac. The salsa is like five or 10 calories. So you're really only looking at about 550 calories for these two big ass tacos. They're gonna fill you up. There's a lot of protein, a lot of carbs, a lot of fat. Realistically, not that bad for you. So cook up some ground beef on a skillet. Throw some uh, spray on there, turn it up really high for like 15 to 20 seconds, throw the tortilla on there, let it burn until the bubbles kind of come up, then flip it over, do the same thing. Leave it on only for like 10 seconds a side. You'll get it nice and crispy and it'll be like that like chipotle kind of feel. Because normally if you eat those flour tortillas like just stale out of the bag, they taste kind of gross, but if you let them cook up on the, on the skillet for a minute, they taste good. Y'all ready? Thank you.